welcome to our latest from the sidelines with our good friend John Aiken. It was a tough trip out west last week, and John, um, I want to get into this from a couple different angles because first, just how difficult is it at the D three college level to go on such a long trip and manage results and performance and all of that with a college team? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, first of all, a lot of these trips that we do, you know, these cultural trips, you know, we've done to Philly, we've gone mm-hmm. to New York, we've gone to D.C., you know, we, we tie in something, you know, with that, um, you know, uh, so so that's a component of these trips, uh, you know, you know, getting, you know, flying out on a Thursday evening and then uh, playing a 7 p.m. game West Coast time, which is really 10 p.m. for a kickoff really really demanding you know um physiologically you know you're you're supposed to um you know get there a few days ahead of time start to adjust your sleep schedule you know we we can't do that you know we're not we're not built for that so um not having that extra preparation time you know both not being able to really afford a trip of that you know kids can't miss the class time you know we kind of threw these guys to the wolves especially in the in the first game you know playing the number 14 team in the country uh, and we just we struggled to adapt to that. So, um, you know, uh, it's it's hard. It, it's it's very hard. But I think, uh, you know, facing some of those challenges, we'll be able to rely on what we learned in a difficult environment later in the season, you know, in conference play that that will you know position us for, you know, hopefully, a, a you know, a conference tournament win or, you know, an NCAA tournament berth. I mean, that's that's why we play very difficult games early, even in the most difficult circumstances um you know i think it was 104 degrees when we kicked off our second game um you know at five o'clock in in redland so so b- between you know a different type of heat than we're used to here um and then the, the time change uh it was it was it was challenging but i know the guys will always enjoy uh spending uh, their off day at laguna beach for uh for the rest of their lives so <laughs> well all, all is not lost how do you how do you kind of manage the disappointment with the results with the positives that you did see on the field? Because I mean, we, we've all been through these kinds of games before, where the the result doesn't look good, the scoreline doesn't look good, but there are those positives that you can build upon for upcoming matches. Yeah, I mean, we we look at all of our our preseason or or non-conference games as a way to evaluate really where we are. I mean, we play nationally ranked teams to find out where we are in the grand scheme of things. And, you know, we've got a revolving door with our goalkeepers. Um, You know, we've taken a look at a young guy. We gave a guy, uh, you know, who's been with the program for a couple of years, who's been, you know, a backup or second or third, a chance to start a couple of games early. Um, you know, and then we rotated a, you know, our our starter over the last couple of years who's coming back from injury and, and, and play games. So, you know, starting from the you know the goalkeeping position, we've we've evaluated you know where they are and where we're going to be moving forward. So that was that was encouraging, and and, and that's a positive uh, because we really find out who they are because you you can't really find out um, you know just in training. Um, so that's a positive. And the other thing is you know we played against you know like give an example like Redlands had like four grad students right, so they're you know twenty twenty two twenty three twenty four. And we've got 18 year old kids playing some of their first college soccer matches. So, you know, four years of the weight room and, you know, uh, just being, you know, stronger, you know, guys playing against, you know, some kids that have played club soccer last year. Um, So that's eye opening and helping them adjust to what the the real standards are to be on a, 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 you know, national caliber team. You know, I I would hate for us to play weaker opponents and, and, um, you know, think that these guys who had success at the club level all of a sudden jump into college level and they think they're easily successful. Um, that's, that's not a positive for me. So that's why we kind of threw them to the wolves. And, you know, I mean, I mentioned this to a couple of people before, but I remember looking up at the scoreboard um, at Redlands, the second game of the weekend, which is traditionally a, a really difficult game, you know, on a long road trip and looking up with, with three minutes to play, the score was, you know, uh, or the shot count was 15 to 15 and the score was four one. And that, usually means poor finishing on our part, which it was, and, you know, lackluster defending in key moments. And that's really what the difference was. So, you know, the standard was kind of thrown out to the guys, and we didn't live up to it with regards to that as far as taking our chances and, and, and denying some, you know, some, some things that we, we probably should have. But, 
but that's okay. You know, that's, uh, you know, we're learning about our, our guys and those guys are learning about the standards. So th- those were the real positives, you know, coming from away from the weekend. And I'd rather have it that way than false results against weaker opponents early. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, the, the, the program as a whole is better where you're tested in these moments and, and you see who can rise to the occasion. Now, you know, it does give you, I think, more to work with and you get to see on some of these long trips. Uh, and this is at really any level when, when you get away with a team for a period of time, you, you get to see how things come together. I think you get to see maybe the, the psychology of the group a little bit more when you're on the road with a team for an extended period of time. And, you know, we're, we've talked about it a lot here with Atlanta United and the change in, in the vibe with Rob Valentino taking over and then Gonzalo Pineda from what it was under uh, Gabriel Heinze. You know, how do you feel about the, the vibe of your group at this point in the season? Um, you know, you, you can't discount the you know the disappointment and the disillusionment from from the results of being in a team that's 0 and 4 um that being said i'm excited to to see them that disappointed in themselves yeah. and um you know because you know they care and you know they know that that's not where we expect to be and i think you have to ex- have expectations um first and foremost before anybody can rise to those um, and people will always tr- will traditionally, you know, rise to those expectations if, if, if they're capable of it. So, um, so that was good to, g- good to see. And I, I think, um, you know, the, the continuity of the group was there. We just have to clean a few things up, but that's, that's what training's for. And we're looking forward to getting back on the field, uh, this afternoon. Did you see any kind of leaders in the group start to emerge? Uh, I did. I, I think, you know, the, the interesting thing about, you know, our groups and I have to coach this up in, in, in them sometimes is, you know, all our kids, I mean, at Oglethorpe and I'd say traditionally, you know, division three in general, I mean, there's some really, really good people and they're going to be, you know, the next uh, people that start a charity that, you know, help a million people around the world. And they're going to be CEOs and doctors and lawyers, and they're going to be such successful people later. Sometimes they're a little too nice. And, you know, when they, when they get on the field and, and, you know, some of them have it in them, but some of them are a little hesitant to, you know, really kind of grab the, you know, the reins, if you will, and and, and just go all out personality wise. Um, So I saw some of that. We, we need more personality um, to, to basically say, Hey guys, you know, you're, you're coming with me. We're, you know, we're, we're not quite there, but we're, we're going to get over the hump and this is how we're going to do it. So, um, I, I saw inklings of that, but but we definitely need more to you know overcome some of those adverse situations, which we're definitely going to face over the over the course of the rest of the season. Now, something you kind of alluded to, the shots are coming. Like it feels like from the games I've seen, the 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 shots are coming, the chances are coming. All of the the build up play that I'm accustomed to seeing from your teams is there. The finishing hasn't been. Um, this is something that I think everybody always asks from the outside looking in. It's like, okay, team's not scoring goals. How do you fix it? You know, what are you, what are you doing? Are you doing more finishing drills? Are you doing different drills? Are you thinking about changing the, the shape or the personnel? When a team just isn't scoring the goals that are kind of on the table for them, how do you handle it as a coach? Um, I think there's two ways you, you can handle that. You, you continue to chip away and kind of believe in everything that you're doing. And I think that's one way to do it. Um, but, but there's also an alternative. And I don't think either one is right. And I, I've done it both ways. Right. Um, in the past, I've just continued to, you know, hammer things home. Uh, I think this particular way, we're going to tweak, you know, how we set up our team a little differently. And, um, you know, I know we've talked about, you know, formation not being the end all and be all, but there are certain things about certain formations that lend itself to, uh, you know, maybe a bit more successfulness, um, a bit more success uh, based on the personalities in your team. So we're going to tweak our formation, you know, going from a four, three, three to a four, four, two, um, because I think some of the partnerships that we have um, and the characteristics of the players that we have in those positions um, are going to support each other a little bit more. And I think that that might be the, you know, what gets us over the hump of, you know, getting the results, you know, going our way. Because we are creating chances. Um, and I think 
you know, we, we could have won all of those games, you know, it, with a little yeah. bit more quality, but I think we, we might create different kinds of chances, which may lend ourselves to be uh, a bit more successful with us lining up a different way. Yeah. It's funny. Like that, that kind of reminds me of a little bit of an old school mentality and this game's so cyclical. You know, I mean, people give Pep Guardiola credit for the false nine when I think you can really go all the way back to Hungary in the 50s playing a a false nine, not a traditional number nine. And everything gets recycled. And now we are starting to see that where when goals aren't coming, you know, I I remember coming up, it was, oh, then play two up top. You got to have the right partnership up top. It can't just be one if you're not scoring enough. You got to have two forwards. But the way right. they function has definitely changed. And I, I could see with your system and your philosophy, two up top being really, really interesting if the two mesh and, and really find that chemistry that's needed. Yeah, I, I think it's an understanding of the movement, which you obviously have to rehearse again and again and again and, and just you know recreate those scenarios about, you know, hey, the ball's here. This is where you should be. Um, this is how you're going to occupy the, you know, the the center backs or the, you know, the the setup of the other team, and and these are the types of run years you're, you're going to make. So you kind of, you know, support them in their movements, which can, you know, um, be different looks for them. And I think some of that's refreshing, and then some of it's just going to keep other teams off balance. Yeah, and and the off balance portion is something else that. I've noticed a lot lately that I want to get into with you. Um, I'm seeing more teams do this. And I think for me, it started on a, on a regular basis. And maybe it just feels like a new trend because I'm seeing a bunch of teams pop up doing it uh, with Scotland in the euros. And it goes back to personnel. You know, you're kind of, you're trying to figure out what the best personnel groupings for your team is. And it depends on your specific personnel. It doesn't, it's not just a, a global situation of you're not scoring goals to play two up top. It suits who you have, and you're going to see how it works. I'm seeing teams like Scotland and the Euros with two strong left backs or two best players playing in a 3-5-2, 3-4-3, or a line of five with one of them as a center back, but a left-sided center back. We saw it here with Nashville with Alistair Johnston, who does the same thing for Canada. It feels like it's happening more and more and more I want to get from a from a coach's perspective how you would prepare to do that if you have two great right backs and you want to get them both on the field, but it doesn't really work to play one as a right winger like we would traditionally see a lot of times. You want to play them in a line of five, but play them both on the right side. And then when you see a team do that to you, what are the what are the instructions you give your team to deal with it? Because it can really be a difficult tactic to to defend. Sure, sure. Well, I, I think basically when you set it up, um, either like Scotland did, or I think you said like Nashville did, um, w- when you have a traditional right back and basically a you know a second right back, you know one is deployed, um, you know much earlier, and you're trying to you know occupy the space and pin in the other team, and then when that right back. Um, you know, uh, the, the inside right back, if you will, or, or the, the, the right sided center back, right. You know, these late runs coming in are really what tries to keep people off balance. So it's a very secure system. There, there's two sides of it from the defensive standpoint, you know, when you're defending against a team that can, you know, good aerially, um, you know, you have three guys in the most dangerous area of the field where most goals are scored, you know, in front of, the goalkeeper. So you've got just more space covered from a starting position. Um, so that's, that's a very safe and secure thing. It also requires a lot of uh, fitness from those, you know, um, the out, the, the fifth, you know, the, the outside uh, backs traditionally in, in the five. Um, but the attacking side of things, like I, like I mentioned, it's the late run that usually breaks teams down in, in the 2v1 you know, two v one situations where yeah. you can get to the end line and get the other team turned facing their own goal, which you know, usually is you know, what you're trying to do and, 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 and score some goals that way. So um, every team and every coach probably has uh, you know, a different way to maybe time it out as to when that happens. But essentially, that's what you're, you're trying to do. 
Um, and, and the other thing, um, you know, you might ask that that right footed player to maybe sit home a little bit more if the other side is going to kind of get forward. So it just it just depends on those characteristics. But those are the two things that I think with that system, you, you get support defensively in the center of the field. Um, and then, you know, you can create late runs um, if, if those people are traditionally right sided center backs or, or left sided center backs. It feels like I'm seeing more teams play with three center backs in general than I can really remember. I mean, I guess three five two and and four four two would kind of come and go either way, but I I don't remember growing up as much and I don't remember seeing as many teams and maybe Thomas Tuchel and what he's done at Chelsea's part of this too, with playing three center backs. It feels like a a setup that is in vogue right now are, are you seeing more of that to- totally agree totally I totally agree I mean I, I think you know if you think back when it was a three five two traditionally it was two man markers and a sweeper right yep. in yep. the 80s 70s 80s kind of thing this is totally different this is three center backs traditionally center backs um you know who are bigger stronger um you know the, in the sweeper f- formation that guy basically read the game right um, yeah, I think like a back and your in best, that role. Your your best player. They were the technical one. They yeah. could read the game. They could even be slower um, because of that situation because they could read the game so well. This is traditionally, you know, a, a flat back three, if you will, and then you have the other players starting out as the wing backs to create a line of five to basically keep the game in front of you and from a set position. And, um, you know, when you're countered, you've got three big guys in the middle to, you know, to, to win some balls dumped in. It's fascinating now to see Atlanta United who have gone to this because we saw Atlanta early on play three center backs when the opposition played two forwards. And, and that really goes back to kind of what you were saying about man markers and a free man, although the, the sweeper role, I think, is, is very different than it used to be. But now Atlanta's playing with three center backs right now, and, and maybe because of the quality of the center backs that you have to work with, and it's just getting your best players on the field. But Alan Franco, as the central of the three, I'm seeing a lot of kind of sweeper in him because he is dropping off a little bit, and he's, you know, it's not quite man marking because not everybody's playing two up top, but you're seeing the other center backs deal with the attackers more and Franco is more free and reading the game and stepping out when he reads it. But it feels a little bit like a throwback or a hybrid of what we used to see out of that position. And now where the game has gone today. Yeah. I mean, I think at some point when there's, you know, if somebody's pressuring the man with the ball, somebody has to provide cover based upon the principles of the game. So um, they probably designed it where, you know, Franco has certain characteristics a little bit different than the other ones. And, you know, and maybe it's, you know, with the ball, he's better and, you know, reading the situations, um, you know, I'm not sure, you know, why they have that, but it, it makes sense, um, you know, that one of them are going to do it. So, yeah, it's, it, I think a lot of people expect it because in the past when we saw, and I, I think Frank DeBoer did this a lot with Miles Robinson as the middle of the three. And it was, I think, really purely about his speed. You know, he's able to just cover so much. He was the free man in those spots. And now Miles is in a position where, as we've seen him grow and mature, and we saw it a lot with the U.S. men's national team, his 1v1 defending is excellent. You know, to have him in the free role kind of wastes that a little bit. So Franco's the free man, and Miles is shutting attackers down. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got to, you know, play to people's strengths. And, I, I mean, he's one of the best in, you know, the country, maybe in the world, in 1v1 defending just with pure athleticism and his, his ability. He's gotten so much better over the last few years reading the game. And, um, yeah, it's just you know, you've got to play to people's strengths. I think that's the the takeaway that I always try to, to bring to the table whenever we start talking about formation or tactics, not philosophy, which – shouldn't change very much or you know can be high elements of it can be highlighted depending on tactics but tactics and formations it is about play into your team's strengths and your specific team that you have that day I mean it can change game to game even but also hiding your team's weaknesses 
and and finding that balance between that while fitting into the overall philosophy that's a lot for you to juggle it it is it is and i and i think none of us really get it right all the time and you know we can just basically go on our instincts and you know the players we have available at the time to try to fit all of those pieces that you talked about in a puzzle to hopefully put it together on the table and make a clear picture um you know and and even within that there's moments where certain pieces make things a little bit more clear. Um, and, and, and that's what we're hoping for. You know, we're hoping we can just set the team up, you know, have players thrive in those scenarios. And, and, you know, and even when they don't, they know, you know, I mean, classic example, like the Emory game, we, we played them, you know, off the park and we ended up losing, but we felt good coming away from that because of, you know, so many good things we did, um, you know, is building on those moments. Yeah, and that's the hard thing I think with players sometimes and you know all of us who've played have kind of gone through that where it does feel like everything's headed in the right direction but when the results don't come then your job becomes as a coach kind of becomes more of that psychologist in a lot of ways of of continuing to build that side of the game and making people I think believe in the process because it, it's always a process. Yeah, absolutely. And you just have to keep hammering away and, and you got to believe that, you know, things, things are going to work out. It's not always easy. And, you know, when, when you're winning, that's, that's an easy thing to believe in, but, but also like, you know, going back to where we started, you know, is it, is it a false belief based on your opponents, based on some different things? And um, we, we've set ourselves up to, to be challenged early and the results haven't gone our way, but we have a very good team. And I, I think, you know, we, we believe in what we do and we just got to keep believing to, you know, to turn the corner. So the games keep coming fast and furious. Two games this weekend. Who's coming to town? We've got Lynchburg, uh, a traditional regional power. Um, we've gone back and forth with them over the years and wins and losses and always, always won goal games. Um, we've got them Friday. We're celebrating our 60th anniversary of – of men's soccer at Oglethorpe, one of the two oldest programs in the, in the state of Georgia, Oglethorpe and Emory. And um, so that's exciting. And we're also honoring um, John Salamone, uh, class of 86, who was our team captain um, who died in the World Trade Center. He uh, worked at Cantor Fitzgerald on the 104th floor. And his family is coming down, as well as the coach, uh, Bucky Reynolds, from the 1980s. Um, he's, he's making a trip down from Virginia as well. And ironically enough, he, he uh, went to college at Lynchburg. So it's oh, wow. going to be a <laughs> it's going to be a good one. Uh, Friday night, we've got tailgate five to seven for all our alums. And then um, Saturday, we've got the number three team in the country, Calvin from Michigan, coming to town. Uh, they'll play Emory on Friday and us on Saturday. So, um, yeah, fast and furious. And we're, we're definitely not dodging anybody. Hectic, hectic stuff. Uh, if you guys can come out this weekend to Oglethorpe, highly recommended. Two really good games. And, you know, I think you know, if you've listened to this podcast since John and I started it, you kind of get a sense of, of what he wants to see his team play like. And it's good, entertaining soccer. Um, it's great for kids to come out and see, too, because you, you're up close to it. You, you can see those adjustments really, you know, up close. And it's free. No, no admission charge. So, uh, best, best, uh, free soccer in, uh, around even better. And if you can't make it out and you should, if you can, but if you can't, you can watch, uh, go to the schedule link at gopetrels.com and you can watch the games there. John, thanks for the time. I'm looking forward to the games this weekend. Yeah, me too, Jason. Thanks so much for having me.